My talk today is on uh, ethnic diversity, federalism, and uh, statehood in Africa. Uh, particularly, I uh, address on how uh, African countries are trying to uh, accommodate uh, different cultural and uh, ethnic groups in their uh, territories. Uh, historically, Africa has uh, the most diverse uh, ethnic groups uh, in, in the world. So the, the structure of my presentation will be uh, on uh, pre-colonial African state, uh, the colonial legacy, the post-colonial state, uh, ethnic diversity, and the African state, as well as how federalism and decentralization has been used to address uh, ethnic diversity in uh, the region. So uh, pre-colonial Africa, uh, I think, uh, many scholars didn't uh, show properly how Africa had its own civilizations, its own status uh, before colonial powers uh, came to Africa. Uh, during uh, the pre-colonial time, Africa had its own uh, states. These states have uh, centralized, strong uh, status. Uh, in some cases, they were very egalitarian, where uh, decentralization has been used, but due to the absence of uh, proper discussion on the pre-colonial pre state in Africa, uh, many scholars uh, only studied the post-colonial African state, but Africa had its own indigenous uh, state formation. Uh, but this indigenous state formation didn't continue because uh, first there was an encounter with the Europeans. It was the transatlantic uh, slave trade from the 16th century to the 19th century. Uh, Europeans have been uh, taking human uh, resources from Africa for millions have been uh, transported into the Americas and in North America to work in uh, agricultural plantations. So the first um, encounter with the Europeans uh, disrupted the indigenous state formation we had uh, in Africa. So because of uh, the, the conflicts between the different tribal groups for cont controlling the trade in uh, slaves, uh, many African uh, governments uh, or status, uh, they were in, in civil war. So the indigenous state formation was disrupted. Uh, immediately after uh, the end of uh, slavery, then colonialism. In uh, 1884 to 1885, the European powers met in uh, Berlin to decide on how to scramble, uh, divide Africa among themselves. Uh, so in a few months' time, they brought about the African map and they divided Africa according to uh, the, the power balance they had uh, in, in Europe. So um, immediately uh, after, uh, before the, the First World War, uh, almost all African countries became uh, under uh, colonial rule. And the Europeans, they uh, def redefined the uh, boundaries uh, which existed uh, during the pre-colonial time. So they brought different um, ethnic groups in one uh, country, and also they uh, separated uh, homogeneous uh, indigenous groups uh, in Africa. So when, when you compare uh, the, the state boundaries before colonial powers came to Africa and after the uh, colonia coloni colonization, uh, there is, a, there is, there is a significant uh, differences. And uh, one of the reasons why it has become very, very complicated for Africa to address uh, ethnic and um, cultural uh, uh, diversity is because of the impact of uh, colonial, uh, colonialism on uh, state formation uh, in Africa. Uh, what are some of the legacies of colonialism on uh, the, the state formation in Africa? Uh, basically, the, the way uh, 
the Europeans tried to formulate uh, state in Africa is uh, based on the concept of a state developed in Europe after the Westphalian uh, system uh, of 1648. So they uh, disregarded traditional uh, state and uh, institutions. Uh, the British, uh, they have been using colonial institutions, but they used it for advancing their own interests. So uh, the, the pre-colonial African tradition and governance was completely destroyed by the, the colonial powers. So the post-colonial state in Africa was largely uh, a continuation of the, the colonial state because uh, the new Africa leaders who came to power immediately after the end of colonialism, they had dilemma. Should they go back to pre-colonial Africa and restore their traditional rule, or they should continue to adopt the colonial state uh, system, which has been given to them by uh, colonial powers, so there, there, had, there had been debates among the African scholars, but finally uh, most of the African uh, countries decided to adopt the colonial state, which has already been uh, formulated by uh, the Europeans. So when uh, African countries became independent, particularly in the 1960s, most of these African countries became independent. Uh, most of them were under British and French colonial powers, and uh, they inherited the language, like the national language became English or French, uh, and also the boundaries, which has already been created. These arbitrary boundaries, which have been created by colonial powers, were uh, forced to be a continuation even after uh, Africa became independent. So one of the, the challenges for Africa is whether to re redraw the maps or to continue uh, the, the already defined territories given to them by uh, colonial powers. For instance, if you see Somalia. Somalia was one indigenous ethnic group uh, before colonial powers came to Africa, but after colonialism, uh, they had um, French uh, uh, Somalia, British Somalia, and Italian Somalia. And when you see the present day Nigeria, it is just the British, they brought different tribal groups in one country, which didn't exist uh, it before. So uh, the post colonial state had uh, still now continued to have this challenge of maintaining national unity on the one hand and also accommodating diversity uh, on the other. So that's why the uh, African states uh, are um, in a very, very uh, weak position in, in both cases. Because on the one hand, they, they have to maintain national unity because unless they maintain national unity, they may uh, resort to like conflicts, ethnic conflicts uh, among the various uh, tribal groups in the regions. Uh, on the other hand, if they completely ignore uh, local identities, that would also be a source of uh, instability. So uh, the post-colonial state, uh, there is, this is uh, a book which was uh, written by Professor Yang, who, who is really a uh, prominent scholar on the post-colonial African state. And uh, the post-colonial state, African state became like more corrupted uh, and also weak and civil war in many of uh, the countries in Africa. Because uh, the state uh, formation or the, the, the kind of state these uh, African countries uh, decided to adopt has different problems. Uh, most of them, they just uh, adopted a unitary form of government like the British or the French model. On the one hand, many of the uh, ethnic groups in their ter territories demanded more autonomy and decentralization. So during the 1970s, 1980s, and uh, even and up to the 1990s, there has always been conflicts in many of these countries. Uh, the genocide uh, in Rwanda, uh, the conflict in Somalia, Sierra Leone, 
Liberia. Now the, the, the conflict in uh, Central Africa Republic, uh, Uganda, all this have this uh, the, the, the problem of how to uh, accommodate uh, diversity and as well as maintaining uh, national unity. So uh, most of the African countries didn't uh, adopt or didn't prefer to adopt decentralization or granting autonomy to uh, the minority groups in their territories because they, the, 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 there is a threat for disintegration and also uh, conflict and war. But uh, some African countries, they try to adopt federalism. Federalism is uh, granting or separation of power between the central government and the regional uh, government. So theoretically, there has been uh, different discussions as to whether federalism could be the best uh, form of government to accommodate ethnic diversity. Uh, different scholars have been promoting this idea that uh, minority, minority groups, uh, the rights of minority groups should be accommodated in the form of self-determination, decentralization, and granting of uh, autonomy. Particularly, Professor Elazar, who is uh, uh, really the best known uh, scholar on uh, federalism, he argues that uh, multinational countries should uh, able to provide autonomy to the minority groups. And also Professor Wilkie Milika, who is also uh, best known for his work on uh, accommodating minority writers, he also promotes that autonomy is the most important way of addressing uh, demands for uh, cultural autonomy in, 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 in many countries. So different countries have been adopting this this form of government if i have like in the in europe you have switzerland belgium uh, and also like india and other countries they have this uh, federal government or federal system of government where uh, power has been uh, divided between the central as well as the uh, regional governments uh, it has been successful in, in some countries, like in Europe, like Switzerland or in Belgium. Uh, this granting of autonomy to minority groups have been successful in many ways. But uh, the problem is largely whether this form of government could be uh, functional or effective in developing countries like in Sub-Saharan Africa, where you have uh, already uh, <coughs> a, a very uh, serious uh, conflicts, uh, poverty, and other social and uh, economic problems. Uh, whether uh, a federal political system uh, is relevant or not uh, is still uh, under discussion, particularly uh, like uh, scholars like Professor uh, Kimlika uh, argues that uh, his work has uh, mainly uh, uh, focused on the uh, cases of like Canada and uh, Switzerland and some developed countries, but he was not really very um, confident about the application of like uh, federal system to accommodate ethnic diversity in poor countries could function because these these countries lack uh, institutions. Uh, they lack uh, different. Uh, uh, economic uh, uh, systems to, to address uh, uh, the problem. So he's not really supporting that, that system. So uh, the system uh, could be even, uh, would be uh, divisive. It can be, it could be manipulated when it is applicable in the context of developing countries. It could be easily uh, manipulated and uh, used by uh, ethnic entrepreneurs to advance their own uh, in uh, their own interests. So that has been, uh, as we have, we are going to see it later. Uh, this has been the case in many of the uh, developing countries, particularly like Ethiopia, Nigeria, and other countries. So um, uh, let us see some of the examples where uh, decentralization and uh, federal system of government have been adopted in Africa. Uh, these countries are mainly South Africa, uh, Nigeria, and also uh, Ethiopia. Uh, 
compared to uh, the rest of Africa, these, these countries try to take uh, some risk because uh, they, they uh, try to provide some level of autonomy and rights for cultural groups. Uh, let's see first about the case of South Africa. Uh, South Africa was uh, uh, like became a state uh, after uh, in 1909 uh, uh, the British Parliament decided to establish the South African uh, state, which was which was divided uh, in different regions. Uh, then uh, in 1950s, uh, starting from in 1940s, uh, the apartheid system was. Uh, used by the government in, uh, in South Africa where uh, the regions were divided according to ethnic lines. That is uh, the Bantu star regions where uh, the black people had uh, their own regions where they have to live and the whites had their own uh, state and region where they live and there should not be any, like particularly the black community was not allowed to live and work in uh, uh, settlements for, for in white settlements or white regions. So due to this, um, the Bantustan uh, apartheid regime, there was movement against the apartheid system, particularly the African National Congress was um, uh, playing a significant role to uh, eliminate and also uh, bring about democracy and transformation in South Africa. So uh, when South Africa became independent, or up after the, the end of apartheid in 1990, there was uh, a discussion uh, because some groups demanded uh, cultural autonomy, particularly the National Party, uh, which represents the Africans. They demanded uh, autonomy in uh, Western Cape region and also uh, there was a demand for self-administration in the uh, KwaZulu-Natal region. So during the constitutional uh, discussion or during the, the drafting the constitution, different uh, like form formula or different ways of addressing um, uh, the rights of uh, minority groups have been discussed. And NC African National Congress was largely uh, trying to uh, formulate a unified government or national unity government or a unitary government where uh, minority groups might have a very, uh, uh, may not have to be really having their own autonomy. While the national party promoted more decentralized government, uh, drafting the constitution um, was very, very controversial because of these differences. Finally, they agreed that South Africa would maintain its national unity, but cultural and linguistic rights will be protected. So they recognized 11 official languages uh, uh, for the government or to be used by the government, and also self-autonomy uh, for uh, the Western Cape and also the KwaZulu-Natal regions. So it's a balance between uh, maintaining of national unity as well as uh, diversity. So this is one example uh, in South Africa where you have different uh, languages have been used for accommodating um, diversity. So this is one of these, uh, the, as you see from the map, um, uh, Western Cape uh, where the Africans are predominantly living, they have uh, some uh, cultural and linguistic related rights, particularly in terms of education, uh, the region has uh, a very wider autonomy and also the same with KwaZulu-Natal. But the other regions are, def uh, are demarcated according to economic or other uh, regional factors, not really based on cultural or ethnic uh, lines. So this is one of the, the solutions uh, which has been uh, practiced in South Africa. This is one, one model which has been used. Uh, the other uh, country where federal system of government has been used uh, uh, to address uh, the, the demands for uh, ethnic uh, diversity is in Nigeria. 
Nigeria has uh, particularly three major, uh, major ethnic groups. The Hausa, which, who are mainly Muslim, and also uh, the Igbo, as well as the Yoruba. So these are the major three ethnic groups which dominate uh, the Nigerian uh, uh, the political system. Uh, even if there are over 250 other minority groups in, um, in the country, these are the most important uh, ethnic groups which dominate political uh, decision making uh, in Nigeria. So uh, when Nigeria became independent from the British, um, there was always uh, a disagreement between the elites, whether Nigeria should be one strong uh, Nigerian state which were uh, uh, ethnic or cultural uh, groups should not be given any uh, state recognition. That was one option, but uh, that, was not war uh, that was not really uh, accepted by other groups. And finally, a federal uh, or uh, decentralized form of government was adopted uh, in Nigeria. So uh, first, they adopted uh, a federal system in 1963. Uh, then it was revised in 1967. Then uh, in 1996, now Nigeria has 36 states. Uh, it started with three. Now it ended up having 36 regional uh, status uh, in Nigeria. As you see here, this was the first uh, demarcation and uh, regional formation in Nigeria. It, it lasted uh, from 1963 to 1967. Uh, then uh, in 1967, uh, it, grow, uh, it grew into um, almost 12 states. Then it became 36 uh, in 1996. So uh, this is one of the, 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 the ways how to address uh, ethnic diversity. But in Nigeria, there are some uh, important, uh, uh, important um, really uh, uh, lessons that we can take from Nigeria. One is uh, at the national level, even at the local level, English is uh, the only national language they use. So like in, in South Africa, we have said that uh, there are uh, 11 languages, national languages. Here it's only English because uh, most of the languages in, in Nigeria are not really in a written form and they are not well developed as well as it, it will be very complicated to single out uh, other local languages for use to, to be to, to use for um, uh, national uh, 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 language. So there, there is no any uh, local language which has been adopted for uh, national uh, languages. So this is one advantage. The other uh, is that the British, uh, even if they have been using um, the traditional institutions for promoting their own uh, interests, uh, still Nigeria has a very strong uh, traditional institutions. So the cultural, ethnic, uh, and local identities are always expressed in uh, in the, the uh, traditional institutions uh, still practiced in Nigeria. So since there is some form of autonomy, even if uh, these powers are not necessarily recognized by the government, traditional institutions have power. Uh, traditional chiefs have power in Nigeria. So this might have also balanced the demand for ethnic autonomy or uh, cultural autonomy and also national unity, but still there are tensions. Tensions between the Muslim Norths as well as the Christian South. And also even within uh, the different Christian uh, groups, there is also uh, tensions. There has been civil war in, in, in Nigeria, uh, in Niger Delta region, where uh, the, the region demanded for uh, even cessation. So this is also another example where uh, Nigeria tried to uh, maintain its national unity, uh, at the same time try to accommodate uh, regional uh, uh, identities. Uh, I think maybe uh, the most complicated and also uh, really the most uh, uh, maybe risky 
uh, project was um, adopted in Ethiopia. In Ethiopia, uh, uh, we have an ethnic federal system where uh, regional um, boundaries have been demarcated uh, entirely based on uh, ethnic identity. So uh, I, have, I have been uh, doing research on uh, the Ethiopian uh, federal system. So I will give you a background as well as how this uh, federal structure has been adopted. Uh, historically, uh, Ethiopia is uh, the only African country which, uh, which was not colonized by uh, European powers. So uh, it had its own monarchy uh, until in 1974. Uh, so Haile Selassie was the last emperor of Ethiopia. Uh, so it had uh, really, Ethiopia had really uh, its own um, uh, civilization, its own institutions, and uh, many European powers had really very, uh, very good relations with the Ethiopian uh, monarchy for a long time. But uh, in 1974, as uh, many of us may know, in 1970s there was uh, communist movements around the world, and uh, the same happened in Ethiopia. So in 1974, uh, the students and the military uh, they removed the emperor from power, and the military assumed uh, political power and declared that socialism is uh, ideo uh, the ideology of the state. Uh, but uh, different political groups, uh, they rejected uh, the military government. So uh, the military government uh, was executing, uh, torturing uh, its uh, opponents, so uh, tens of thousands of people were killed in prison and hundreds of thousands of people forced to uh, flee uh, the country. So at uh, the time, particularly immediately after this military government came to power, uh, it uh, had this red terror where uh, it was trying to eliminate its political uh, opponents. Uh, so this led to civil war. Uh, most of the political groups that led this movement were ethnic-based political parties, particularly uh, the, the, the political group that finally ousted the military government is the Tigrayan People Liberation Front, which represents the Tigray region, which is one uh, dominant ethnic group in Ethiopia. The other was the EPLF, the Eritrean People Liberation Front, because Eritrea was part of Ethiopia until uh, in 19. 91. So these two uh, groups have been uh, waging a war against the military government, and finally, uh, the military government uh, was removed removed from power in 1991. So during the civil war, uh, hundreds of thousands of people have been uh, killed. Uh, so uh, this was the, the, the beginning of uh, the new ethnic federal system in Ethiopia. Historically, Ethiopia had a very strong centralized unitary government uh, for a long time. But uh, this constitution, the constitution adopted uh, in 1995, it provided that each ethnic group has the right for self-determination, including cessation. Uh, still, uh, the constitution uh, provides such very liberal kind of uh, rights for ethnic groups, and um, this has uh, brought about a significant uh, political uh, controversy and a debate in Ethiopia, because uh, many uh, political groups are uh, against this uh, ethnic-based political arrangement. Still, there are many other uh, political groups which claim that this is the only way that uh, the rights of the 80 ethnic groups that we have in Ethiopia uh, could be represented and exercise uh, their rights. So as you see from the map, uh, according to the Ethiopian constitution, we have now nine regions. Uh, these regions are demarcated entirely based on ethnic lines. As in the north, as you see the Tigray, which is the dominant ethnic group that uh, played a significant role to uh, defeat the military regime. Then there is an Amhara uh, uh, ethnic group, which considered to be the dominant group before uh, this government came to power. 
the Oromo and other ethnic groups. But as you see here, it's only nine states we have. But Ethiopia has uh, 56 ethnic groups, uh, uh, 80, 80 ethnic groups, more than 80 ethnic groups. But uh, 56 of these ethnic groups are in the South Nations and Nationalities uh, region, which is just in one region. So even if the constitution provides for self-determination for each ethnic group, we have only nine, nine regional states. So that's also one of uh, the, the, really the, the, the problems of the, the system itself. It provides self-administration, autonomy for few, few um, uh, ethnic groups, and it uh, deny the same right for others. So there is now a very significant movement now in the Southern Nations and national, uh, Nationalities region where uh, different ethnic groups are demanding self-autonomy, uh, uh, like other ethnic groups in Ethiopia. And also there is now inter-ethnic um, conflict and rivalry between these ethnic groups for controlling political power. So uh, compared to Nigeria and uh, uh, like South Africa, uh, the federal and decentralization uh, uh, really policy in Ethiopia is, is very, very uh, complicated. So um, one, one problem is that there is no any uh, homogeneous uh, region. Uh, every region in the country is uh, heterogeneous. So how the problem is how uh, the rights of minority groups in that region could be protected has become a very uh, serious uh, uh, challenge for, for the region. So there are arguments whether uh, adopting such radical um, ethnic-based political system uh, could provide. Some say it has some benefits like uh, some opportunities, ethnic federalism has enabled ethnic groups to have local governments uh, compared to the past regions where they were, uh, uh, they didn't, they were denied to have such rights. And also these ethnic groups have been exercising their linguistic and cultural rights. Uh, and also they say that it um, provides a, fr a framework where uh, intercultural dialogue uh, could be uh, used to bring about uh, uh, agreement and uh, consensus between the different uh, ethnic groups. But uh, many other uh, researches uh, indicate that uh, this kind of political arrangement has different challenges. Because uh, mainly the problem is there is always tension between the Ethiopian identity uh, and also the local identity. So people are always, uh, really th there is a competition between a national identity as well as local identity. So this has um, uh, uh, completely undermined uh, the, the national uh, identity as, as Ethiopians. Uh, people uh, have really now uh, serious challenges to, to say that they are Ethiopians because uh, more and more uh, focus on ethnic identity and uh, added ed 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 ethnic and cultural uh, writers has really uh, undermined their knowledge and also the, their uh, uh, like uh, use of the, the, really the, the Ethiopian identity for uh, different um, uh, purposes. Uh, the other is uh, the competition. Now the relationship between the different ethnic groups has become now very strained. Uh, competition for resources uh, and also uh, recognition, like for instance, Amharic is the national language of the country or the official language in the country, but other ethnic groups and cultural groups are demanding that their culture and uh, their culture and uh, language should be recognized as uh, national or uh, official languages. Uh, the other uh, that I, I mentioned earlier, uh, what about minority groups which live in uh, a region where one ethnic group has uh, dominant, the, uh, the dominance or the control of the political power? Usually um, in uh, ethnically defined regions in Ethiopia, other minority groups living in those regions, they don't have any rights. Their rights have been denied. So, so one of the problems is how the rights of these minority groups uh, could be protected. Uh, 
The other, the one I mentioned earlier, there is still a very, very serious differences between political groups about how to accommodate national uh, unity as well as diversity. So uh, there is a very serious tension, particularly as the country is heading for election uh, 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 this year in May. Uh, the tension is between these uh, uh, groups. The other is, uh, for the last many years, uh, after this uh, ethnic federal uh, system was adopted, uh, there has been um, uh, repression of uh, democratic rights in the country. Many journalists, human rights activists, scholars have been imprisoned uh, or even uh, killed by the government. So this has exacerbated the ethnic tensions between uh, the different uh, groups in Ethiopia. So uh, it's common now to find uh, ethnic conflicts in different parts of the country. Even some groups, uh, some ethnic groups in the country are uh, demanding for cessation to be separated from uh, the Ethiopian state. Uh, as you see here, uh, millions have been displaced due to ethnic conflict in Ethiopia. Uh, even Ethiopia is um, a country with the largest internally displaced people in, in, in the world. Over three million people have been displaced in the last few years because of ethnic conflicts. So uh, if this ethnic-based uh, political arrangement is um, the best mechanism to address ethnic uh, diversity or demands for uh, cultural autonomy, why we have all these conflicts. So uh, even after we have such devastating conflicts in the country, uh, there isn't any ag agreement on the role of ethnic-based uh, political system in Ethiopia. Still, uh, ethnic-based political parties, they do not want to recognize the fact that the cause for the ethnic conflict in Ethiopia is this, this, uh, the, the ethnic-based political system. On the other hand, other political groups, uh, they argue that unless otherwise we reform the ethnic-based political system, the conflict and uh, the tensions between the different ethnic groups will be uh, will continue. So, the Ethiopian model is, uh, in many ways, it looks like the model that uh, has, that was used during the the Soviet Union and also former Yugoslavia, where uh, ethnic groups have been granted with all the powers, including cessation. So, some researches indicate that. Uh, Ethiopia might be the next Yugoslavia because the ideological foundation of the Ethiopian uh, federal system is the same as former Soviet Union and Yugoslavia, as well as the political changes and tensions that we have been witnessing the last many years is the same uh, like the one we had before the disintegration of uh, Yugoslavia. So. Uh, this, this model has been uh, really in, in serious uh, a problem. Uh, uh, since uh, April 2018, uh, we have a new prime minister, Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed. Uh, he is from um, the Oromo ethnic group, which is the dominant uh, or the major ethnic group in Ethiopia. Uh, many of the elites from this ethnic group, they are more for ethnic uh, division or autonomy for the Oromo people and other ethnic groups. But when he came to power, he uh, addresses the Ethiopian people for uh, national unity. And he uh, promised that he's going to reform the institutions and uh, even the constitution uh, because he, he uh, said that uh, unless otherwise we have a solution for these uh, conflicts and differences, uh, the country could not continue. So he had really unprecedented support from the public because uh, many of the people, particularly those who had promote national unity, they, they supported him. So still now he is in power and also he has other important achievements. Uh, 
there was civil war between uh, there was conflict between Ethiopia and Eritrea since uh, in 1998 because of the border conflict because after Eritrea separated from Ethiopia uh, immediately like after five years uh, there there started uh, border conflict between these two countries so it continued uh, until uh, last year but still of course the border has not been demarcated but at least there is now some sort of peaceful relation between Ethiopia and Eritrea, so this was his big achievement. And because uh, many of uh, the rebel groups against the Ethiopian regime were uh, operating from Eritrea. So now, now this peace agreement has helped uh, to bring about really uh, stability also uh, to Ethiopia. But uh, Many uh, international uh, uh, groups, uh, human rights groups, are uh, very much concerned that there is a very serious tension between the different political groups in Ethiopia. Despite the fact that Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed has promised for reforms, there are very, very strong ethnic-based uh, political groups which are uh, trying to uh, remove him from power. Particularly, the next election, uh, would be a very, very important uh, for this country. Uh, if uh, Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed uh, able to win the elections, at least uh, the country could really maintain its unity and might continue, even if it might be very, very difficult for him to uh, undertake uh, a, a reform uh, and change the constitution. But if ethnic-based political parties are winning the election, I think it will be uh, a very uh, serious problem in the country because they will just separate most of uh, these regions. And also, uh, it will be very difficult because Ethiopia didn't have any uh, peaceful and democratic elections in its history. So even uh, it will be very difficult to uh, I really say that there will be peaceful election and also the post-election uh, conflict is maybe uh, the case uh, in Ethiopia. So uh, as I tried to uh, present uh, earlier, uh, to accommodate ethnic diversity, cultural diversity in the context of Africa, these three countries, South Africa, Nigeria, and Ethiopia have adopted different mechanisms while the rest of Africa uh, they do not uh, want to really um, recognize national or the, 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 the identities, local identities. So they, they promote more or less um, national unity. But um, other countries are trying to follow the Ethiopian example, like South Sudan, because there is now ethnic conflict in South Sudan. And now some suggest that the best uh, uh, state structure for South Sudan will be ethnic federalism because there are so many ethnic groups. Uh, like Rwanda, for instance, uh, it uh, tried to accommodate or try to address uh, the, 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 the conflict between different ethnic groups through eliminating the differences because you, uh, before the genocide, you can say um, Hutu or uh, Tutsi, but now uh, uh, it is, it's a crime even to say that uh, you are a Hutu or a Tutsi. So that's one solution. So in Africa, uh, one of the challenges ahead would be uh, how Africa could address the demands for local autonomy. Is it to uh, only promote national unity, ignoring local identities, or taking a risk like Ethiopia where <laughs> you grant much autonomy to uh, these local uh, regions uh, and risk disintegration and instability, or is there any balance to uh, address uh, uh, the demands of cultural groups as well as uh, national unity? So thank you for uh, listening to my, my talk.